came to North Carolina to establish a church in an unchurched city, Durham, North Carolina. And since that time, still preaching all over North America, he had time to build a church, a great church, averages well over 1,000 every Sunday. I believe last Sunday it was over 1,300. I take real pleasure tonight in introducing the speaker for tonight, Brother Johnny Godair. Let's preach with him tonight and see what God will do in this place. Amen. Before the lights are turned out. Thank you, Brother Williams. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. What a time we're having at General Conference. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. The Bible says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm glad there's liberty and freedom in this house tonight. Let's all clap our hands to the Lord. While you stand for just a moment, let me express my appreciation to our general superintendent, Brother Urshan, all of our officials, Brother Becton, Brother Williams, Brother Kilgore, the general board and executive board, and all the department heads that make this a tremendous fellowship. It's a joy to be here tonight and to be in this conference. I've enjoyed everything that has been said and done, all the tremendous preaching that has taken place service after service in this conference has truly been outstanding and uh, I'm just very very thrilled to uh, be a part of such a tremendous fellowship as the United Pentecostal Church and you say praise the Lord this is a great fellowship and God's people are the greatest people on the face of the earth there are no people like God's people how many are glad you're baptized in Jesus name and filled with the Holy Ghost Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen, amen. And thank you to my dear, wonderful friend, Brother Williams, who has been a tremendous help and inspiration to me through the years. I also count it a privilege to be able to speak on the same general conference as my dad, who spoke to us yesterday morning in the home mission service. That's quite an honor for me to get to speak in the same conference as my dad. He'll be 76 next month, and he's embarking on a new adventure of taking a, taking a small work and already tripled it since he's been there and um, looking for exciting things there. So I thank the Lord for my dad and mom who are here tonight. If you'll open your Bibles, please, I would like to uh, call your attention to the book of Ecclesiastes, and I will read from chapter number seven. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 7 and verse number 8. Amen. I will try to be mindful of the time. I heard, a, uh, heard about a small boy that was telling other people, some other boys, about his pastor's sermons. He said, um, all of my pastor's sermons have happy endings. Somebody said, is that so? He said, yes. Everybody's happy when they end. <laughs> and so all of them had happy endings. I do realize that the best ingredient in most sermons is shortening, so I'll try to be aware of the time. I was reading something the other day that says, when you speak, speak not only so that you can be understood, but speak so that you cannot be misunderstood. Amen. And I, I want to speak tonight so that I cannot be misunderstood. And I recognize that no sermon is ever quite a success that leaves men satisfied with themselves. And I believe that throughout this general conference, we've all been hearing some things and feeling something in the Holy Ghost that has caused a divine restlessness. 
and a divine discontentment in our souls. I think a lot of us are going to go home from this conference dissatisfied with ourselves, not with the Holy Ghost, not what we've received from God, but perhaps in our own personal involvement, I believe that many of us have desired to do more for God. How many in this great audience have that very wonderful desire to do more for the Lord than you've ever done in all of your life? How many believe the Lord is coming soon and you want to be ready? Somebody else to be ready. Let's lift our hands and praise him one more time. Whoa. Chapter 7 and verse number 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou doest not, dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Now, I'd like you to notice, please, in verse 8, the Bible said, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Verse 10 says, Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? And then one other scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, chapter 3 and verse 15, chapter 3 and verse 15, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. And God requireth that which is past. I speak tonight on this subject, God's demands on today's church. Please be seated. <clears throat> this 71st General Conference of the United Pentecostal Church has been a time of reflection on our past. Glorious and wonderful has been the blessings of God upon this fellowship that we all love. This fellowship that was brought about 50 years ago with the merger of two oneness groups to form, I believe, the largest apostolic fellowship in our day. Someone has so aptly said, the past is our heritage, the present is our responsibility, and the future is our challenge. And while we dare not tonight just simply live in the past, I do believe that it's good at times to reflect upon our past. And I believe that we ought to do so in order to gain greater understanding of God's purpose and in order to better equip ourselves for the great job that God has us to do in the future. The scripture says in the verse that I read tonight, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. I cannot believe for a moment that God has brought the church to this hour to fail. I do believe that we have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. And this scripture, I think, gives us an insight into the fact that God expects there to be motivation. And God expects there to be growth that will propel us to a grand conclusion of this glorious church. I believe the principle of that verse should apply to the church of Jesus Christ tonight that we're a part of. The group that we're a part of tonight had a glorious beginning in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. 120 strong, they gathered together in the upper room. And the choir just sang so beautifully about it. The Holy Ghost came. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. From that humble beginning of 120, now we reach all 50 states and around the world. Brother Sism gave us a report the other day that uh, we now have works in 131 foreign fields. His report stated that last year there were 103,409 that were baptized in Jesus' name. 
139,735 were filled with the Holy Ghost. He stated that we now have 16,021 churches and preaching points overseas with 1,729,173 constituents and 9,977 national preachers. We've come a long way from the upper room. Hallelujah. I want to say tonight that revival is happening in our day. It's not that it's going to happen. It's not that it might happen. It's not that it possibly could happen. Happen. I'm standing here tonight to state that revival is happening in this hour. Praise God, and I want to be a part of it. I believe I'm with a group of people tonight that want to be a part of last day, end time, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost revival in the church. Say amen. And yet with all of these great things happening, there's almost 6 billion people on our planet. And when we recognize that, we recognize that we have only scratched the surface. We have just begun. Our job has just begun. And lest any of us would become proud of our meager accomplishments, let me, let me state tonight that the majority of this world has never yet heard of the United Pentecostal Church. The majority of our world has never even heard that this church exists. It is truly harvest time. This is the time and the day for harvest. And with the challenge of our general superintendent and the others that are on the commission, I hope that we can greatly respond to Harvest 96. I believe it's God's will that we see more people brought to God in 1996 than any single year in our existence. I believe it can happen. I believe it can happen. I believe it can happen. I don't believe we peaked out. I don't believe we've seen our best revivals. Call me an optimist or whatever you want to call me, but I believe our greatest days are ahead of us. Hallelujah. Someone has said, the difficult we will do immediately and the impossible will take a little longer. But I believe this can be the finest hour for the United Pentecostal Church. We just heard the testimony of a young man brought out of darkness in the last few days. How many more are out there in Des Moines tonight and all across America and around the world that need the same life-changing, transforming power of the Holy Ghost that this young man has felt in these last few days? Folks, this is our day. This is our hour. This is our time. Amen. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 5 states, He that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth change. Now sleep is a necessity. And sleep is a blessing. It is an indispensable experience. But it does at times become sinful. Sometimes sleep becomes sinful. It becomes dishonorable. It becomes shameful. It becomes a thing of the devil. It becomes the unwanted badge of disgrace. The writer said, he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. Sleep is a blessing and harvest is a blessing. But to sleep in the time of harvest is to brand ourselves as sons and daughters of shame. And I don't believe this church is going to sleep in the greatest hour and the greatest potential and the greatest opportunity that God has ever given to mankind. I believe our church is going to accept the challenge and have the greatest revival and see the greatest number of souls come to God we've ever seen. Amen. 
If ripened fields goes to waste, who really cares? If unchurched cities are not evangelized, who really cares? If entire countries are not reached with this great gospel, who really cares? If drug addiction destroys our young people, who is it that really cares? If alcohol consumption is on the increase and destroying thousands of lives annually, who cares? If the children, even in the United States of America, are afraid to go to school because of the knives and the guns and the crime and the drugs that is there, who really cares? If divorce is touching almost every family in America tonight, one way or the other, who is it that really cares? I believe there is a church tonight. I believe there is a body of believers that cares whether men go to hell. Hallelujah. If the, if the gay crowd is making giant strides under this present administration in Washington until it seems like to me that they're all coming out of the closet, who really cares? Amen. It seems that our generation is only interested in that which will give them ease and physical pleasure. But I believe in the midst of this dilemma that God is raising up a group of apostolics that are going to face the challenge of this hour. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gathered in this assembly hall tonight are thousands of Pentecostals that are not satisfied with status quo or past blessings, but there is a hunger, there is a thirst, there is a desire deep down in our spirit that says we've got to do more than we've ever done. Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Where are the hungry? Where are the thirsty? Where are the seeking hearts? Hallelujah. I feel especially bad for today's youth that are faced with such a vacuum of meaning. Our young people today must ask themselves, am I the result of mom forgetting to take the pill? Am I just a biological accident? Does anyone really want me? Or am I just a tax deduction conceived to prevent the government from getting too much of daddy's money? There's no dignity in that kind of living. Kids today need to know who am I? Why am I here? Hallelujah. But from almost the moment of their birth, they are loaned to such a number of babysitters that they can hardly recognize their parents. No wonder they are growing up jabbing needles and popping corks in lost bewilderment. Folks, we've got a job on our hands, but the power behind us is greater than the task that is before us. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not here to condemn tonight. I'm in the same boat, jury, and I'm just trying to struggle and have revival, but I'm not satisfied with myself. I'm not satisfied with what I'm doing. There's a harvest field that's waiting for church tonight. Oh, hallelujah. And don't say there's yet four months and then cometh harvest, but church, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white and they are ready unto harvest. Let's praise him tonight. Hallelujah. 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 I read the other day where someone wrote a little about sin. Sin is deceitful. Sin promises pleasure, but it gives pain. It offers life, but it gives death. It opens out as bright as the morning, but it closes as dark as the night. Sin is a beast of prey under a velvet paw. It conceals a claw with which it wounds and lacerates those who would stroke it. In every sin, there is the seed of another sin. It is self-propagating. Amen. It is self-propagating. Sin roots itself in the soul of the sinner until he has used up every bit of the good soil in his soul. Sin corrupts the nature, perverts the taste, weakens the will, and sears the conscience. 
Hallelujah. I've heard some preaching in this conference about repentance, and I thank God for it. Because I believe where we're going to have the revival that God wants to send, we're going to have to come back to an old-fashioned preaching of repentance. Hallelujah. And turning from sin, we'll never see the revival that God wants to send unless there's an old-fashioned spirit of repentance that comes into this church. Hallelujah, hallelujah, and with every evil deed, inclinations toward evil become stronger and stronger until he cannot cease from sin, and the sinner is consumed by his own lust. Sin is a very promising employer, but is a terrible paymaster. Our generation is headed toward hell as fast as they can go. And the church has got the only answer that's going to help them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We must be about our father's business. The church has the only answer. They cannot turn to business. They cannot turn to politics. They cannot turn to other places. I submit to you tonight, brethren and ladies and gentlemen, that the only answer for a sin-sick world is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have that message. Somebody shout hallelujah. I read in Time Magazine some times back, they related the results of a 112-question Bible quiz. They'd ask this to youths in school. When they got the answers back, it was quite disturbing. Here's what their answers were in the Bible quiz, 112 questions, to young people in public schools. Number one, Several pupils thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were lovers. Number two, they, they thought the four horsemen of Revelations appeared on the Acropolis. Number three, they said the Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luther, and John. Number four in their answers on this, que on this quiz, they thought that Eve was created from an apple. Number five, they thought that Jesus was baptized by Moses. And number six, they thought Jezebel was the name of Ahab's donkey. I won't comment on that. When we took prayer and the Bible out of public schools, we made a tragic mistake. Let me say it again tonight. When we took prayer and the Bible out of public schools, we made a tragic mistake. They may take it out of the classroom, but they can't take it out of our hearts. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Then we got our real wise guys in this day. They say, well, I can't understand the Bible. I'd, I'd read the Bible perhaps, and I'd like to know what it says, but I just can't understand the Bible. So I picked up the Bible the other day, and I started reading. Some time back I read where it says, he went into the house. And they say the Bible's hard to understand. And they and, and the verse just says he went in the house. So let me give you some type of a little exegesis on what that means. He is the opposite of she. Went means he ain't here no more. Into means he ain't outside. The means just one. House is where folks live. Now that wasn't hard to figure out, was it? I'm telling you tonight, church, it's not that our world can't understand it that much, but driven by carnal, materialistic, new age nature and philosophy, they've turned away from the truth of Almighty God. Hallelujah. But thank God for the word tonight that's still alive and still lives in our hearts. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy, forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. I tell you, 
tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We need to come back to a revival of the Bible, a revival of believing God, and God stands ready to prove his power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. I read in Psalm chapter 44 and verse 1, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us, what work thou didst in their day, in the times of old. Notice what he said. We have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us, what work thou didst in their day, looking to the past. The people of God at this time were in captivity for 70 years. They were in bondage and affliction. The temple was destroyed. The walls were leveled. They were 500 miles away from home. They had nothing but memories of past blessings. All they could look at was what God used to do. I'm here to thank God for what he's done in the past. I'm here to thank God for every revival, every service, every storefront, every tent, every schoolhouse meeting, everything that's ever brought us to the place where we are now. Hallelujah. But I think it's time that we begin to turn our attention on what God wants to do in this hour. We're faced with a generation that needs an answer now. They need help now. They need prayer now. They need faith now. They need God now. Here they are, just memories of past blessings. They remember how that God parted the Red Sea when Moses stretched out his rod. They remember how that when they asked for water, he gave them water to drink as he smote the rock. They remember that when they said, we want something to eat, God gave them manna from heaven. Every morning, they walked out and on the ground lay a small round thing called manna, which means, what is it? Every morning for 40 years, they had, what is it? Every day, praise God. For 40 years, six days a week, God gave them manna, and he gave them enough on the sixth day to take care of the seventh day. Hallelujah. I don't think God's going to fail this church in this hour. I think we can relax tonight and trust the God who has never failed and who has never made a mistake. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you were to equate that in terms that we could understand, every morning, every morning before they got up, there were four train loads of manna, 60 boxcars long. Sent from heaven. Four train loads, 60 boxcars long. Every morning, hallelujah, manna make fresh in heaven's ovens every morning. Oh, hallelujah. If God sent 240 boxcar loads of manna to the children of Israel every morning, I believe he can take care of our needs. Hallelujah. Amen. And now then, they are reflecting back how that shoes grew on their feet, how that clothes grew on their body. And uh, the children are saying, I wish it was like it was back then. They said, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their day. It was a look back. But in Psalms 48, as we come four chapters forward, and verse number 8, they are now back in their homeland. Hallelujah. And God has brought a deliverance. And here's what they're saying now in Psalms 48 and 8. As we have heard, so have we seen. Hallelujah. First they said, we've heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us. But now then God's brought a deliverance. And they're saying, as we have heard, so have we seen. The young people of our day and the young couples of our day need to see the power of God in the church. They need to see miracles take place 
They need to see healings and manifestations of the Holy Ghost. I submit to this church on this Sunday night that God has not lost his power. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. I remember when I was just a, a young evangelist, the Williams mentioned that when I first went to North Carolina, 1959, preached a revival in a church in about 70 miles from where I presently pastor, never dreaming that the day would come when I'd go and start a home missions work in that city. But 70 miles away, I preached a revival. And I remember some of those great days. But I remember that before that, I went down into the state of Mississippi to preach a few nights revival. And I just felt a call to preach. And my dad said, well, if you call, go ahead. Give it a try. I'm not sure what he thought I'd do, but uh, he let me go. And so I went, and, and, and there was a couple of hundred people in the church. And uh, Brother Williams, on that first Sunday night, the house was full. And, and I got up and preached as a young evangelist. And, and not one soul came to the altar. On Monday night, that was back in the days where we had church seven nights a week. Monday night, some of you remember those good old days. All the evangelists will not say amen. But on Monday night, the house was full. I preached a message. Not one soul came to the altar. On Tuesday night, I preached a message. The house was full. Not one soul came to the altar. On Wednesday night, I preached another message. Not one soul came to the altar. That was four consecutive nights, and not one soul had come to the altar. I went back to the pastor's house where I was staying, and I got alone with God in that bedroom starting about 11 or 11.30 and started praying. And, and, and this is what I said. I said, God, I, I thought I was called to preach. I really did. If I made a mistake, forgive me. I, I really thought I was called to preach, and, and I'm down here to preach, but I have no desire to preach if souls are not going to come to God. Now, I still feel that way. Brother, you can say what you want to, but I'm not interested in preaching week after week after week. Hallelujah. And nobody repenting and nobody getting baptized and no one getting the Holy Ghost. I've got to see that revival. I've got to see that power. Do you feel that way tonight? Hallelujah. And so I started praying about 11 or 11.30. About 12, I was still praying, God, I've got to have an answer tonight. I can't preach dead sermons. I can't preach and just go through the motions. I don't care how much they pay me. I'm not going to preach. I'll go back home and get a job. Everything will be all right. And about 1 o'clock, I was still praying. And 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock and about 4 o'clock, if I remember right, almost 4 o'clock, I was still praying in that room. And God gave me an assurance. I've called you. But you're going to have to lean on me. You're going to have to trust in me. Hey, friend, it's not our ability. It's not our power. It's not our strength. It's not our music. It's not our singing. Is anybody still with me tonight? I said the revival that God wants to send this hour is not by music. And I'm not downplaying that. Thank God for it. We got the best in the world. But good music don't bring revival. And good singing don't bring revival. But we need to beg God tonight for the old time power of the Holy Ghost. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so... At almost 4 o'clock that morning, I got an answer. I went to bed and went to sleep. We went to church on Thursday night. The crowd was about the same. The service in the first part was about the same. I preached, but I preached with more of a burden that time than I'd been preaching before. When I got through preaching, it was either 15 or 16 people came to the altar. Five of them received the Holy Ghost. And I got an answer from God that night that let me know it's not our ability and our expertise and who we are, how we can do it. For it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. 
Hallelujah. 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 I ask you tonight, where is the church at this crucial hour of man's history? Are we addressing the sin issue as we should? Are we still faithful to the gospel that saves from sin? Hallelujah. The art of almost saying something is quite in vogue these days. Hallelujah. I like what I've been hearing in this conference. I like what you preach, Brother Mooney, today, wherever you are. Thank God for that apostolic message and all of these other preachers, the ones last night and all day today. Praise God. But we live in a day where it's quite in vogue to almost say something. We hear speakers that get off to a good start, and you feel they're going to hit the nail on the head. But before they get to the point, they definitely swerve over to one side, and they make a neat little detour. They almost say it, but not quite. The act of almost saying something is very clever. It sounds smart, and it won't offend anyone. Hallelujah. And it'll help to get the speaker ahead in this world. But this world is not the right world to get ahead in. I come here tonight not to be offensive, but to remind you that the same message that's worked in the past is what's going to work in 1995 and 1996. Repent of your sins. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hey, folks, that's still our message. Call it my candy stick if you want to. That's still our message, and it must be preached. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to remember that at the end of the road stands God. And God always says something. We need men of God in this hour who will say with David in Psalms 85 and 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. And in 1 Kings 22, 14, we need to be as Micaiah who said, What the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. I believe we need an uninhibited, unchained, unfettered, unshackled pulpit. Where the preacher is not bound by money, our position, our power, our things, our the number of people he's preaching to. I'm not talking about being offensive. There's no place for that in the ministry. I'm talking about preaching the truth in love. Clap your hands with me tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. A dead message will never bring results. I said a dead message will never bring results. And a live message from a dead preacher won't bring results either. Hallelujah. I said a live message from a dead preacher will not bring results. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Thank God for education, but there's not a seminary in America that's got the magic formula for revival. You know what we need? We need more for the Tetramarians that's full of faith and full of anointing and full of function and full of power and not ashamed of the gospel. Glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. Please be seated for a moment. 
The magic formula for revival is not produced in a seminary. There is no magic formula for revival. The formula for revival is not in rhetoric. It's not in debate. It's not in skillful presentations. It's not in how skillful I am and uh, how much expertise I have in pulpit mannerisms. Paul said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul says that the kingdom of God is not in work, but it's in power. We need an old fashioned, powerful demonstration of the Holy Ghost. It's the only thing that's going to bring America back to God and back to its knees and back to revival. The churches that it seems to me that God is blessing are the ones that are preaching about sin, about death, about hell. Amen. It's not just a little pseudo-charismatic sermon on Sunday morning to appease the Sunday morning crowd whom you're afraid if you preach the gospel you run them off and lose their money. Give me all of your magical formulas. But when Brother Andrew Urson preached and Brother C.P. Kilgore preached, they wasn't trying to just please a certain set of criteria before them. They got up and said, whatever God says, that's what I'm going to say. We need to come back to some old-fashioned, God-anointed preaching. There's nothing wrong with the church. That some good old fashioned Holy Ghost anointed preaching couldn't cure. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. If there is no sin, then we don't need a Savior. If we don't need a Savior, then we don't need preachers. And that'll put you and I out of business. But the fact is that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believed. J.B. Phillips states that the book of Acts describes the church of Jesus Christ before it became fat and out of breath by prosperity. I'm going to say that again. J.B. Phillips states that the book of Acts describes the church of Jesus Christ before it became pat and out of breath by prosperity. That early church was the place where they did not say prayers. They prayed in the Holy Ghost. They prayed till answers came. Whatever happened to old-fashioned pray and prove? I said, whatever happened to what the old timers call an old fashioned pray and through? Someone said, I present chromium plated, over organized, streamlined, computerized evangelism is about as effective as trying to melt an iceberg with a matchstick. We need to come back to the book of Acts. We need old-fashioned prayer. We need prayer without ceasing. We need prayer that shatters the status quo. We need prayer that drains us of all of our other interests.
Revival. That was brought real to me a couple of Monday mornings ago when we had 93 men and women in our noonday prayer that we have every day and have had for several years coming off of their jobs just on the noon hour. 93 men and women gathered in that prayer room praying, oh God, send the power just now. Our people want to pray, but there's got to be a climate a, a climate provided for them that's conducive to old-fashioned prayer worship. We need prayer that excites us by its immense possibilities. We need prayer that sees God who rules on high, almighty and saved. We need prayer that laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done. We need prayer that sees everything under his feet. We need prayer that is motivated by desire for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Prayer has got to be more than a ritual. The place of prayer is more than a dumping ground for all of our anxieties, our threats, and our fears. The place of prayer is not a place to drop a shopping list before God and say, here's my list, God, fill it out for me. Hallelujah. I believe that the place of prayer is not only a place where I lose my burden, but it's a place where I get a burden. He shares my burden, and I share his burden. And he said, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And to know that burden, we've got to hear the voice of the Spirit. And to know that voice, we must be still and know that he is God. He that hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Hey, apostolic, God is calling us back to prayer and fasting and worship and fellowship and preaching and loving God and loving one another. Many of you have read the book. I quote from the book, Are We Yet Alive? Our sickness is more serious than we first suspected. We are in trouble. You and I, in our United Methodist Church, and I'm certainly not throwing off or casting it on the Methodist people. I'm simply reading from this book, Are You Yet Alive? We thought we were just drifting like a sailboat on a dreamy day. Instead, we were wasting away like a leukemia victim when the blood transfusions no longer work. Hear this Methodist pastor. Once we were a Wesleyan revival, full of enthusiasm, fired by the Spirit, running the race set before us like a sprinter trying to win the prize. The world was our parish. We were determined to publish the glad tidings of good things. Our Wesley-inspired dream and directive was to spread scriptural holiness across the continent. Circuit riders raced over hill and valley. New churches were established in every hamlet. Our missionaries encircled the globe. But now... We are tired. We are listless. We are fueled only by the nostalgia of former days, walking with a droop, eyes on the ground, discouraged, putting one foot ahead of the other like a tired old man who remembers but can no longer perform. That must never be written about the United Pentecostal Church. This church was born in the fiery blaze of glorious Pentecostal power. We sang, he said, oh, for a thousand tongues, as if it were an anthem instead of a testimony. We celebrated bicentennial as if our future was behind us. I'm here to tell somebody tonight our, our future is ahead of us. Is there a pastor in this house? that'll say, I believe my best revival in my city is yet to come. If you believe that, shout amen. John Wesley, 
John Wesley feared that something like this might, might happen. He wrote in 1786, I'm afraid that the people called Methodists shall, should ever, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist in Europe and America. But I am afraid, hear me, I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having a form of godliness without the power. Oh, my friend, one of the indications of the last days is that they would have a form of godliness but lacking the power. God send the power tonight. My prayer is, God, we've got to have the power. The writer continued to say that some experts believe that the typical pastor, hear this, spends 97% of his time to nurture his members. 97% of a pastor's time is spent on nurturing those that are already members. That is, the pastors are laboring in pastoral care, administration, teaching, and preaching to those that are already members. And the members are happy and contented to be looked after. A lot of preachers are having burnout. I believe we need to build a fire so big and so high on the altar that will never go out. I believe we need to get burned out, but not in the manner that the world is talking about. To the precious saints of God that are here tonight, I'd like to suggest that you don't take up all of your pastor's time just dealing with picky anything that don't amount to anything. Loose your preacher and let him be an evangelist. Hallelujah. 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 And while every preacher loves his church and he loves his flock, it's time for the saints to grow up and mature in Christ that they don't demand all the pastor's time and attention and we can focus where we ought to focus, and that is on the lost. I wish you'd clap your hands. Hear me close. I'm not going to go much longer, but hear me close. The world is in a mad dash toward hell. Souls are crying out desperately for help and for God. And our pastors are so busy counseling with saints that they don't have the time or the heart to reach the lost. Somehow we've got to reverse the trend. From the pulpit to the pew, we've got to get to the place that we're willing to lay aside our own little feelings and petty ideas and lift up our eyes and see the souls that are dying without God. The United Pentecostal Church needs an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival. Years ago, someone stumbled into a Quaker meeting, and they asked, when does the service begin? And the answer was, the service begins when the meeting is over. I believe that's the way it ought to be. Hallelujah. I said the service began when the meeting's over. I'm going to say something tonight that I say at home. I'm just going to make myself at home if that's all right, Mr. Person. I believe that everybody ought to be involved in some kind of a soul-winning activity. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. And if you don't believe that, then I beg to disagree. I believe that everybody needs to be involved. We need all hands in the harvest. We need every man involved. We need every lady. We need every young person. Let me ask you the question. Isn't it true that only about 10 or 15% of our people are doing all the soul winning work of the church? Is it that way in your church? Is there any pastor here that can say 80 to 90 to 100% of our people are involved in soul winning? I can't. 
The biggest problems we face tonight is because we are not facing the fact that God's called all of us to be a personal evangelist. The whole Jehovah's Witness I read a few days ago were building a building in a certain place, and they built it in two days' time. They all got together and unified effort, and they built it in two days' time. Somebody asked them, said, what's the hurry? One of them said, we want to construct this building as quickly as possible so that we can get back to our primary task, and that is witnessing. And I know it's not too popular and may not get too many amens to talk about soul winning and witnessing in a general conference, but I believe if the United Pentecostal Church is going to have the glorious, wonderful future that God designed for us to have, we're going to have to come back to old-fashioned soul winning. We're going to have to get serious about it and get down to business about it. Whoa! Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. That which has been is now, and that which is to be has already been, and God requireth that which is past. God requireth that which is past. It doesn't say he prefers it. It said he required it. It doesn't say he recommends it. It said he requires it. It doesn't say he suggests it. It says he requires it. Whatever it was that brought revival 50 years ago, 30 years ago, is the same thing that's going to bring revival in our day. Acts 2.38, prayer, holiness, old-time Holy Ghost power, the gifts of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Gideon asked in Judges 6 and 13, if the Lord be with us, why then is all of this befallen us? And where are the miracles that our fathers told us of? Our generation is crying out for the miraculous, the supernatural, the power of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ecclesiastes 7 and 10 in my text said, don't say what is the cause, that the former days were better than these. I believe that God is sitting on the balcony of glory, as it were, saying to the church, come on, this is your day. This is your hour. I've invested everything in you. It's time to be up and about your father's business. It's time to pray. It's time to weep between the porch and the altar. Oh, God. Is it possible that we will raise up a generation of Pentecostals who really don't know God and do not know his great works and do not know his power? Is it possible we have teenagers in our church that's never seen a miracle? Oh, I want old-time Pentecost. Joshua 2 says that when Joshua and the other leaders were gone, that there arose another generation that knew not the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't want to see a generation of Pentecostals that do not know the Lord. Oh, that we would know him in the power of his resurrection. Oh, that we would know him who is left among us that saw this house in her first glory. And how do you see it now? You saw it 50 years ago in 1945 at the merger in St. Louis. But how do you see it now? Is the church still alive? Is it still well? Does it still have power? Does it still have the anointing? Does it still have faith? Does it still have prayer? Does it still have the doctrine? Does it still have holiness? Does it still have faith? For his coming, you saw this house in its first glory. But how do you see it now? Oh, God. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than that of the former house. And God said in that book of Haggai that the reason the fields were not bringing forth the fruit was that the seed is yet in the barn. That's the reason you don't have a harvest. He said the seed is still in the barn. The word's on our pulpit and it's on our coffee tables. But we've got to take it to a world that's hungry and dying. Let me ask you something. Is the United Pentecostal Church the world's best kept secret? Is the UPCI the world's best kept secret? The majority of the world don't know we're here. We have the truth, but the world don't know that. 
God's command was to break up the fallow ground. It's time to seek the, seek the Lord. Plant the seed. Expect the harvest. Hallelujah. Isaiah 53 asks, who will believe our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The problem is the world's not hearing our report. The problem is the world lies in darkness. And we're keeping our light in the four walls of our church house. Pentecostal, you can say amen. Or you can sit and look at me if you want to. I'm not here to condemn. I need help just like you do. But I'm telling you, we will never reach the world sitting in our churches, panicking for Jesus and condemning the world and sending them to hell. We've got to go out in the highways and the byways and the hedges and compel them to come in that his house may be filled. Oh, hey, we've got the greatest message in the world. It's a beautiful message. It's a wonderful message. It's a glorious message. It works, but it doesn't work inside of our four walls. Every Sunday night, we sing to each other. We shout to each other. We run the aisles to each other. Come on, say amen. We clap our hands for each other. We enjoy our special singers. We enjoy our choir. We enjoy the preaching, and we're sitting there with each other. But what about the world that's lost? What about a lost world that's right outside the doors of our church? Brother Mike Anderson, would you come to the organ, please? Hallelujah. I believe it's time to say with the four leprous men, after that eating and drunk at the camp of the Syrians, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. Hallelujah. Let us go and tell. Let us go and tell. Preachers, it's got to get in us. Preacher's wife, it's got to get in you. Hallelujah. Preacher's kids, it's got to get in you. Saints of God, it's got to get in you. I don't want to be out of place. And I won't give this young man the big head when I say it. There's a young man here tonight that last Sunday in our church personally brought 147 people to church. Brother Stacy Davis, stand up. Right over here, he and his wife, and my wife, and Brother Robbie and Sister Lisa are all standing there. This is Brother Stacy Davis and his wife. I want her to stand. This couple last Sunday brought 147 people to church, and a whole bunch of them were brand new people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now remember when we won Stacy Davis out of the world, he was a long-haired hippie type. He was on drugs and drinking, and God cleaned him up. Hallelujah. And now he's a soul winner. I wonder how many more Stacy Davises there are that's out there tonight. Hallelujah. They're out there. They're waiting for our message. Oh, church, come on. Come on. They're in your town. They're in my town. They're everywhere. They're desperate. They're searching. They're hungry. They need help. They need God. Until we come back to old-fashioned soul winning, we're never going to see what God wants us to see or never going to do what God wants us to do. Now, I'm going to tell you, and I close with this, and somebody said that an optimist is a person to think the preacher's about through when he says it now in closing. But I'm going to close shortly. But I'm going to tell you this. In Pentecost, we are giving lip service to soul winning. And the world's going to hell. I said, we're giving lip service to soul winning. Brother Cunningham, we're giving lip service to soul winning. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about all of our church. Hallelujah. The world's going to hell. But where are the men that weep? Where are the women that weep? Where are those that sigh and cry over the sin to the people? Where are the people that's got a burden? Where are people in this assembly hall oh we're well dressed we're decked out we look nice we got our best stone and there's thousands here and i'm privileged to be a part of you and i understand more than you do that i don't even belong up here but since i've been asked to be here 
I close with this. We are giving lip service to soul winning. It's about number 10 down on a list of 1 to 10 on things we need to do in our church. But it needs to be number one. It needs to be number one. It's got to be number one. It's got to be number one. I said it's got to be number one. I said it's got to be number one. Where are the weepers? Where are the pastors? Where are the prayers? Where are the people with a burden? Where are the preachers that cry and sigh and weep between the porch and the altar? At the British Columbia camp meeting this summer, Brother Paul Reynolds is here. It was my privilege to be there and preach their camp. But on one night in the first week in July, I stood on that platform. Brother Beckton, God spoke to me. I knew it was God. I stood on the platform. I was 3,000 miles from home. But I stood on that platform. And God spoke to my heart as surely as he's ever spoke to me. And he said, you've been making excuses long enough about getting involved in teaching Bible studies. Now, look, I've taught some Bible studies, I guess enough to appease my conscience. I keep one going a lot of the time, sometimes two, but at that point I had none. God spoke to me on the platform of that camp meeting this summer and said, when you go home, you start next week three home Bible studies. You don't tell the others to do it, you do it. And I knew it was God because he gave me the names of the three couples that he told me to teach. But the man God told me, as sure as I was standing on that platform, you go home and teach three Bible studies, and I'll tell you who to teach. When I went home the very first week after I left there and went home, I got my chart in my car, and I went to three houses. And I took the chart in, and I said, this is the chart, it's home Bible study. I'd like to come to your house and teach you for 12 weeks. Every one of them said, okay, come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I made up my mind that day that, that there'd never be a time that I wasn't teaching a home Bible study. Praise God, Brother Anderson. I made up my mind. I'm not going to just talk about soul winning and give lip service to it. I want to do it. We need preachers that will get involved. We need preachers' wives. And I've heard the old story, and I've been pastoring for 33 years now, and I've heard the old statement, well, you know, sheep beget sheep, and I'm a shepherd, and they're supposed to win the souls, and not me. But I'm going to tell you something, Brother Pastor. Until you do it, your church is not going to get serious about it. Until you do it, your church is not going to get stirred up about it. But when they see you do it, it's going to make a powerful impact. I finished those three Bible studies last week. For 12 weeks, I've been going into three homes. I'm happy to tell you that all of them are baptized in Jesus' name. I'm happy to tell you that all of them but one has received the Holy Ghost, and he almost got it last Sunday night, if there is such a thing as almost getting it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm trying to say to somebody tonight, it's time. It's time to reach our world. It's time for revival. It's time for prayer meetings. It's time to seek God. It's time to fall on our face before God and ask God to forgive us of our slothfulness, our lethargy, our indifference, our lackadaisical spirits, and our unconcern. And God requireth that which is past. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better? Them. Help to win them. We 
friend of lost. Paul was on his way to Rome, 276 men on the ship that he was a prisoner on. It was a storm. The ship ran aground. The hinder part of the ship was broken. They decided to kill the prisoners, but the centurion kept them from their purpose. Hallelujah. And he said, you that can swim, cast yourself in the sea and go to land. You that can't swim, get you aboard and get you a broken piece of the ship. I'm trying to tell somebody tonight, you may not bring 276 to shore. Hallelujah. You may not pastor a great church. You may not sing and play music. But we're in a storm. And you need to find. 